And sometimes you get knocked down in life, but you're not knocked out. And this guy got up and went at it some more. And uh, I love it because if you look at his uh, opponent, his opponent knocks him down, looks at him, and almost like with this, this, this view of disgust, and he goes like this. <laughs> Isn't that what the devil does to us? Like, man, you get knocked down, and he just says, you're done. But how many know that's a ha-ha on the devil because God says, nah. That's what he thought. That's what Satan thought when he saw Jesus on the cross, when he saw Jesus in the tomb. But then on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, and guess who got the last laugh? Yeah, yeah, he may have been knocked down, but listen, our Savior was never knocked out. He got up, and he brought resurrection life, and that's what you and I have every single day. So look at Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Let's break this bad boy down as we get ready. All right. Proverbs 24, 16 says this. Even if godly people fall down, what kind of people? Godly, godly people. How many know that, that just because you're a godly person does not mean that you're not going to fall down? Just because you're a godly person does not mean that you're going to be challenged. Just because you're a godly person, go to church on Sunday, you're here at the 8 a.m., you lift up your holy hands, you worship God, you sing to God, just because you are pursuing Jesus does not mean you will not be knocked down in life. You're going to be knocked down. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. And here the scripture says, even if godly people fall down, how many times? Seven times. Seven times. It says they sometimes get back up. They'll hopefully get back up. We pray they get back up. For some people, it is literally a prayer like, Father, please help them shut up and get up, right? But it's, it, says, it says they always, they always, they always get up. And we have a moment where we feel like the guy that we saw there who's laying there and he just, man, he's in shock. He's in shock. Have you ever been hit with life and you're just in shock? Our church is going through that right now. We are in shock. And it almost feels like a daze. And it almost feels like someone pinch me. Someone wake me up. Someone tell me this is just a dream, a bad dream. But the reality is that in this life, we go through stuff that we can't explain, we can't understand, we can't fathom, and it almost seems like, man, I wonder if we're going to get back up again. You're trying to catch your next breath, but a righteous man may fall seven times, but he or she will rise again. Amen? That's, that's, that, this, this right here should just bring so much encouragement. We can just close it right now and pray and get you out of here. But look at this. But it says, but those, but those who are what? Those who are what? Those who are evil trip and fall when trouble comes. Listen, in other words, it is evil for you to think that it's okay to stay down. It's evil to think that you can stay in that place of pain, in that place of hurt. I'm not saying deny the place of pain. I'm not saying deny the place of hurt. But it is evil when you and I know the word of God and we choose to stay on the ground and quit and give up and throw in the towel and not rise again. The same spirit that raised Christ from the, the dead, the Bible says, is the same spirit that lives inside of you. That means it is evil for us to think that when trouble, when trouble happens, when trouble comes, when you face challenges, obstacles, setbacks, whatever you face, and you have the audacity to just lay there for the rest of your life, it's evil. That's when you know who lives in you. And think about this. How many know that there are all kinds of people in the Bible, men and women, that had issues, problems, challenges, setbacks, family problems, marriage problems, children problems. Read your Bible. Every single man and woman, they faced all kinds of things that happened to them. And how many know that things happen? Say that to your neighbor. Say, it happens. Things happen. They do happen, don't they? And we all have to accept that things that happen in our life that, that, that are going to 
take you by surprise. Let me tell you something. It's inevitable. It's inevitable that you're not going to, you know, have to find some. It's inevitable that you're not going to go through trouble. It's inevitable that you're not going to face some pain. It's inevitable that you're not going to be hurt or betrayed or whatever. That is inevitable. You're going to be offended. It is inevitable. You're going to have to face some things in this life. And listen, whether it's good stuff or evil. Because I know that regardless if it's good or evil, God is still the God of the good person and the evil person. Let me see all my ex-evil people. Yeah, come on, don't be sitting there like you're all. Yeah, yeah everyone's like, you're evil for just doing that. No, he is the God of the good and evil. Read your Bible. God says, I'm the God. You know why? Because an evil person always has the ability to make a decision to change lanes. He's the God of the good and evil. But we're all going to have things happen like bad relationships, bad accidents, bad financial crisis, bad experiences with children. You're going to have maybe a bad, you know, season of your life in your marriage. You're going to have a season in your life where you're going to have some very bad things take place. You know, recently had a friend text me and say, man, I've had something happen every single week for the last month. Like it has been nonstop every single week. Something horrific has happened to me. And of course, I would love to, you know, bring the word and, and, and try to just stir their heart. But no, at that moment, I'm just trying to remind them that, hey, listen, I know that you're going through some very difficult times. But, you know, don't forget who your anchor is in this moment. Don't forget that there, there is hope. Uh, through everything you're facing right now, there is hope. And then you just love them back to life. But I'm telling you, and I don't know about you, but I'm noticing. I mean, you see with the coronavirus or what do they call it now? Something 19, COVAC 19 or something like that. Yeah, it's just, you know what it does? Here's the reality. We're going to face things like that. And this is, this is just the beginning of another disease. It really is. Bible, listen, the Bible says there's famines coming. There's wars coming. There's earthquakes coming. What are you going to do? Live in fear? Question God? Don't be, listen, don't be that ignorant person. Okay? And I say ignorant because the Bible says don't be ignorant. In this world, in this life, you will, you will face trials and tribulation. It's not optional. You don't get to choose how many know that you don't get to choose your battle? When you get that revelation, you'll wake up. You don't choose what you go through. Battles end up just choosing you. I wish we can choose them. But they, 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 they come by surprise. And they really come to shock you. They shock the core of your belief system. Remember your BS? If you've been here the last few weeks, we talked about what's your BS. Okay. It comes to rock your belief system. And when the enemy can rock your belief system, he has you. Because then you start questioning God. You start doubting God. And you, and you keep living. How many more years will you live on that place or that, 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 that questioning, that, that pain or that pointing of the... Like how long would you want to just stay there and not... And not progress and grow and, and change. And I'm hoping in these next few weeks that we can really, you know, get into this momentum of just saying, you know, church, no matter, no matter what we face in this world, we're still the church of Jesus Christ. Like nothing changes God. He's the same God who spoke all these words to us is the same God of today. What he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing it today. And you can't let experiences or bad challenges or things that you're going through, you can't let that dictate how you're going to believe your God. You have to make a divine decision. And I say divine because anyone can make a decision, but not everyone makes divine ones. Divine ones are the ones that God gives you. God gives you an outlet. God says, I always give you a way out. And that's a divine uh, decision he's helping us to to really get a hold of in these next few weeks. So sometimes you're just not going to understand why things happen. And, and trust me, I've, I have found myself in that place plenty of times in this walk with God where I just don't understand. 
and I think that's the hardest part is is trying to make sense of what happens to you. That's the that's the most difficult challenge. And um, I, I but what I've learned in the, in the last twenty three years of walking with God is that you know because how many know that that not everything that you've gone through is someone else's fault. And see, we always talk about what the devil does, but we often don't talk about, but what did you do? What bad decision did you make? What poor choice did you make? Amen? It's true. You know, we want to blame the devil for everything we experience. Let me tell you something. Most of the stuff we experience is really because we choose some of those things. Like, have you ever been so upset at a experience but not realized that before that experience happened, you kind of already knew? Like, there was some form of awareness that I really shouldn't make this decision, but you made that decision anyways. And now you're experiencing the fruit of that decision. And it's just so much easier to blame someone else for it. Right? It's better to just try to find an excuse for it. And then we live this way trying to just not realize or we put ourselves in a position where, where we think that just because whether it was your bad decision or if it was someone else's bad decision that put you in that same place. But I'm always reminded that God will use every bad decision. Come on, whether it's your decision or someone else's decision. And he says, and I will turn it around and I'll use it for something good. That's, that's, see, that's where we can bring joy back into our life. Every bad decision, God can use that, dis, that horrible situation and use it for good. And I know that because God is always looking to repurpose everything we experience. And I'll explain this to you, what I mean by repurpose. He will repurpose your falls for a greater purpose. Um, let's, just take, let's just take water baptism. I know that we always think as water baptism, baptism as this religious ceremony. <laughs> Which in, in some way, it is a religious ceremony, right? You know, it's, it's symbolic. It's religion, religious because it's something we've been doing for 2,000 years, right? But I think what Jesus was trying to do in that experience, it was he was trying to show us that water baptism is something that he uses to repurpose your life for your destiny. It was so important for him for you and I to see this and read this in the scriptures, that he himself was baptized. He was water baptized. Why? Think about it. He went from being the, 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 the person they called, you know, Mary's son, to now he's Jesus, the Savior of the world. So God is trying to repurpose our life, our past. What's the purpose of sins? It's a symbolic symbol of the forgiveness of what? Sins. It's a symbolic symbol of your past failures, setbacks, all these things. And then he will repurpose. You go under that water, which, re- which represents what? Your grave. Come on, he says, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's time to die to those places, Mauricio. It's time to go ahead and give up some of those old ways of thinking and being. And then what does he do? He brings us up with new life, resurrection life, right? So it's symbolic. So think about this. Every bad decision, everything you and I have experienced, God wants to reuse it, repurpose it for a greater purpose to get you to your destiny. And, may, and listen, right now, maybe you're in a place where you still can't understand why you had experienced what you experienced. But let me tell you something, and I can say this from many experiences, I have learned that maybe whether it was six months or a year or two years later, I finally understand why that happened. Or I at least get, you know, some peace of mind just saying, well, you know what, praise God that that actually did happen because it made me a better person. It made me a stronger person. It made me a wiser person than I was then. And seeing this, that's, that's the whole purpose of repurposing what you and I go through. Are you guys getting this right now? Okay, the second reason, the Bible says, I will turn what the enemy meant for evil See, I'll turn whatever the enemy meant for evil, and I'll use it for your good. In other words, if you stay stuck in the reason, you'll never get the revelation. And God is all about the revelation of what he wants you to understand. You know what our problem is? We always want to know, give me a reason why. Well, why did that have to happen? 
Well, why did that person have to die? Well, why did that have to, you know, why did I have to go through that? Well, why did I have to get abused? Well, why? And we can live with that excuse. And I'm not trying to be, you know, very hurtful. I'm not trying to be, you know, someone that's trying to cause you more pain. But here's the reality. If you read your Bible, Jesus was the most loving, compassionate Lord and Savior. How many would agree to that? But let me tell you something. If you really read your Bible from Old Testament to New Testament, God did not sit there, lay there, camp there, wherever the people of God were experiencing. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this. It says that God always went before them. Notice he didn't camp with the Israelites. He didn't, he didn't live with the Israelites. You know, he didn't, he didn't get sucked into the Israelites' complaints. No, it says that the Lord was always before them. Why? Someone has to make a decision to keep moving forward. Aren't you glad that God doesn't park with me? Oh, my God. God's like, no, Mauricio. Hey, man, there's more. We're moving. There's things to do. There's things that need to be done. There's things we have to accomplish. There's, there's stuff that I still have yet to do in you and through you. We have to keep moving forward, but that's not how people think. People often allow their experience to paralyze them and to keep them in that situation for a season. See, the purpose of this, se- of this series is to get us to really start seeing the truth, to see a new perspective. Because it, it can listen, you can be the same person with the same attitude for a year, two years, three years, and be so comfortable with it that you learn how to coexist with it. It almost becomes like, well, this is who I am. Take me as I am. Well, I don't want to take you as you are. I don't like you. You know what I'm saying? Look at your neighbor and say, God doesn't have to give you a reason. And then, and then, and then if their expression was awkward with you, look at them again and say, no, I don't think you heard me. God doesn't have to give you a reason. As if you're that special. (laughs) You know, how many know that God doesn't have to give us a reason for anything? He doesn't have to. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have to explain? I mean, it's amazing how many of us want God to explain himself, but how many of us don't even explain ourselves? (laughs) Oh, you don't like that, no. (laughs) Yeah, talking smack like, oh, God never explains himself. Well, neither do you. You're horrible. We're so good at complaining and telling people, well, what do you give a rip? It's none of your business, but yet you expect God. You put God on this pedestal of you better give me a reason. God doesn't owe you or me any reasons. The only thing he owes us is his peace. That's it. He gives you peace. He gives you joy. And so God doesn't have to give us a reason, but he will give us a revelation of what he's trying to do in our life. And what do I mean by that? Let's just take Martha. For the sake of time, let's go quickly through this. So Martha, we know, had a brother named Lazarus. Lazarus is dead. Okay? But when Martha came to Jesus, he was still alive. Have you ever been in a situation where you're like, God, you still have time to make this right? Have you ever been in a place where, like, God, you still have time to help see me through this? (laughs) Like, God, you still have time to pay the rent. You know what I'm saying? Have you, you're like, and you've been praying. You're like, okay, God, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. You still have time. You can still turn the ship around. You can still turn this situation around for good. Come on, God, this is an evil moment. Come on, this is where you're going to apply that verse, that you'll turn all things that are evil for my good. Okay, do some good stuff right now. Right? Have you ever felt that way? So Martha comes to him before her brother dies. And sends word to Jesus, says, hey, my brother's sick to the point of death. And uh, they're trying to get him to come. But Jesus was about the father's business, taking care of other stuff. And Jesus looked at the uh, person who came, at the messenger, said, yeah, yeah, just tell Martha I'll be there, man. It'll, it'll be all good. I'll be there. I'm coming. And we know that he shows up three days too late. And Martha shows up and tells him, why? Listen, it's, it's just too late, Jesus. It, it, what's done is done. Here's what it says in John eleven fourteen 14 and 15. It says this. So he told them plainly. So he's telling the disciples, hey, let's go take care of this. 
Uh, because Lazarus is what? Dang, talk about straightforward. If you read the verses before this, Jesus was trying to be kind, and they couldn't get it. He was trying to explain to them. He says, hey, let's go because, you know what, our brother Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples, you know what they said? They said, well, it's okay. We can just keep taking our time. He's going to wake up. Everybody wakes up from their sleep. And then he, that's where he says, and now he doesn't plan to know, hey, here's the deal. Lazarus is dead, man. And for your sakes, look at this. And for your what? For, for whose sake? He says, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. See, sometimes for our sake, God won't show up when you want him to show up. For your sake, for your sake. See, sometimes that breakthrough is not going to happen the way you wanted it. It's for your sake. Because we're so good at premeditating how it's going to happen. But for your sake, God's saying, I'm not going to do it the way you think you want it done. I'm going to do it the way I'm going to do it so that you can start believing me. See, you only believe me when I show up on time. I'm only God for you when I do what you ask me to do when you want it. But for your sake, I'm going to show up three days late. Why? Because when, when things are late, that really, it really begins to bring out the real you. And it'll check you. It brings out the real attitude. <laughs> it brings out the real faith, it brings out the real trust or mistrust. It brings out the real you. And so he says, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. And so Jesus obviously, he allows this moment to happen, whether it was the devil that killed Lazarus or whether it was Lazarus eating poorly. Nobody knows why he died. Okay, it could have been that the enemy came to destroy him. Or it could have just been that Lazarus was always just not taking good. Maybe he was just working so hard. Maybe he had a bad cold. Maybe he had, you know, the flu and just didn't. I don't know. Nobody knows. But who gives a rip? It doesn't matter what happened or how it happened. What matters is that we have a God that has compassion and wants to help. And so here you have, you know, a bad situation. But Jesus is saying, but I'm glad I didn't come for your sake because I want to repurpose this pain for you. And we know that he tells the sister, remove the stone. And the sister looks at, at Jesus. Martha's looking at Jesus. Man, you know, Lord, Jesus, if, if, if we remove this stone, it's going to stink. And, you know, some of us right now, we have some stink. We have some stench in our life. The stench of sin, the stench of, 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 of you know, compromise, the stench of, of things, attitudes mindsets that, that don't bring God any glory. But how, how many know that just reading this story of Jesus showing up on the scene of something that is dead for three days, he's still willing to say, move that stone. See, Martha couldn't handle the stench, but Jesus can. See, you can't handle your stench, but Jesus can. And he says, remove that, remove that stone. So they say, man, just do what he says. They remove the stone, and all of a sudden, we hear the powerful words of Jesus. Je he said, Lazarus, what? Come forth. And he came forth, and then he tells them to do what? He said, unwrap him. And you know, what, you know what he says now? After he says, unwrap him, because obviously in those times, they would mummify you. And they, he said, unwrap him. Now let him go. And see, that's what God wants to do with you and me. He wants to unwrap us from that place of staying down too long and heal us so that he can then release us into destiny. That's what he, he wants to repurpose your stench. He wants to repurpose your pain. He wants to repurpose whatever loss, whatever experience has been holding you back for way too long. That's what God does. I love this. And isn't that just like some of us, you know what, we feel like we can't remove our stone because we failed. We can't remove our stone because we deserve it. You know, sometimes the decision you made is what got you there to begin with, and now you have so much shame that you know you stink. 
And some of us do know that it's, it's your fault. You got you there. But whether you got you there or someone got you there or the devil got you there, God is saying, remove that stone. I know how to get you out of there. It's not too late. Don't be that person who says it's too late. This can't change. Uh, you know, it won't change. It, like, you got to stop that madness, that mindset. I love this. Look at John eleven forty five. 45. Look, there's another reason why Jesus showed up late. Look at this. After he raised him from the dead in John 11, verse 45, just a few verses down, it says, and many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this. What? <laughs> they saw what happened? This. Listen, whatever happened to you, whatever's happening to you, it is going to bring many people to a place of belief, believing the God that you serve, believing the God who delivered you, believing that when you go through stuff, you know the only one who gets the glory is God. Because even you and I can't explain how we've, how we've come this far in the natural. But if you're a righteous man, if you're a righteous woman and you have fallen, the Bible says you will get back up. Though you fall seven times, you know how to rise again. Why? Because this one thing I believe that regardless of whatever it is I'm facing, God knows how to bring me back to life. Amen. Can I give you one more thing? Look at this. Everybody say, get up and grow. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 4 through 5, quickly. It says, Jeremiah, say to the people, this is the prophet Jeremiah, he says, say to the people, because I want to give you, uh, I want to give you some, some application you can take home so that next week you come back, we're going to talk more about this. It says, Jeremiah, say to the people, this is what the Lord says. Who says this? Okay, so God's saying this. He says, when people fall down, don't they get up again? I mean, have any of you ever tripped and fall literally, like physically? And then, you, and, then, and then you get up like you didn't fall, like you meant to do that? Have you ever, anyone ever done that before? Yeah, like you fall and you're just like, oh, or you, or you start doing push-ups. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> then you just get up, you're like, yeah. You know, or you pretend you're tying your shoe, right? Okay, so, so this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, don't they get up again? When they discover they're on the wrong road, don't they just turn back? then why do these people stay on their self-destructive what? Path. Why do they stay there? Why do they, like God's saying, I have put the instinct in you to get up. I have not only put the instinct of you getting up in the practical sense, but I have put the spiritual instinct in you of you shall rise again. Why do the people of Jerusalem refuse to turn back. Why? Why do they keep rebelling against me? Why do they keep pushing back against me? They cling tightly to their lies. Everybody say lies. lies. And will not turn around. This is why people don't get up. Because they cling tightly to their own lies. There's, there's no other reason. Listen, the reason that most people don't get up, it's not because they can't get up. It's because they have been holding too tightly to their lies, where their lies have become their truth. And their truth have become their lies. God's not just saying this to be cute. He says, why don't they turn, turn from their destructive path? Why don't they get back up? Why don't they turn from the path that is leading them to destruction? Why? I'll tell you why. Because they hold on too tightly to their lies. There's no other reason. Like if we want to really simply get like a very simple, easy message today, is that lies have the power to keep us down for a long time. Lies have the power to keep you in the place of complacency for a long time. Lies. That's it. Lies. Can you imagine the story of the man who was at the pool? But Thesa, can you throw my, my little mat? Just throw it, thanks. Look at this. Can I get, uh, Will, come up here. 
Just lay there. Quickly, fast, man. We got to go. They're timing me now. Lay down on the mat. Yeah, there you go. Lay down on the mat. Okay. And then we'll just look sick. And camera, you guys can get them. Just, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, bad taco last night sick, you know. <laughs> no, but here's the story of, of a guy. And, and, and it's interesting because if you read the story in John 5 for the sake of time, it says that, that in this place called Bethesda was, was a pool. And the Bible says that this is where all the sick laid. Just stay with me. This is where all the sick. In other words, be very careful that people don't start categorizing you. Like they actually created a place where people that were sick, filled with diseases, it was their spot. Like that's where they hung out. And isn't it funny? Isn't it interesting? And if you look at today, I don't know how they do this, but you know what? Misery loves company. How is it that the negative people know how to find negative people? Like, have you ever, like, how, like, like you see them and you're like, dang, they look alike. They talk the same. They're always, it's always the same complainers. It's like misery loves company. Just like the progressives. The progressives know how to find themselves, right? Those are like, come on, get over it, man. Let's go. Let me, we're going to go win. You got the winners know how to find winners. Losers know how to find losers. I don't know if they just create these Facebook page, group page. I, I don't know how they, but misery, when the Bible says misery loves company, man, I'll tell you, people are so good at drawing to each other. There's a reason for that. Everybody say it's the process of a pattern. That's why people kind of attract each other because it's not that, listen, it's not that there's an issue with you. It's that your life has an issue with a pattern. And it's that pattern that keeps getting you to attract people that have the same mindset. Because it just feels so much more comfortable. The man, the Bible says, the man laid there. When Jesus walked into this area of Bethesda, he said when he looked at everyone, he saw sick people. But there was one man who caught his attention. And it said it was a man who had an issue for 38 years. You can sit in church. You can do life for 38 plus years and still have the same mindset, the same attitude, be negative, always complaining, always blaming others, always pointing the, pe the finger at other people. And we all have a little bit of trauma. You've always heard me say this. We all have a little bit of past, but are you going to keep living in your past? Come on, are you going to keep, are you going to keep staying angry and mad at your family? Or are you going to make a divine decision that, hey, you know what? I got to take responsibility for my life. So it's funny how, how these people stayed by this pool called Bethesda for a reason. They stood by it because they knew that every periodic, you know, year, it wasn't like consistent. The, the, the wings of angels would come and touch the waters, and whoever would jump in that water first would be instantly healed. In other words, there was a miracle that would take place, but it was like lottery. Just think about this guy. After the first year, I'm sure he was hopeful. Five years, still hopeful. Eight years, still hopeful. But after a while, he got so comfortable with being on this mat. And the Bible says that he was on a bed. He got so comfortable. You know what really sucks is when you know that you're so close to your miracle, your breakthrough, and there is nothing you can do about it. That's the worst part. I mean, this man, he, because when Jesus showed up to him, Jesus asked them one question. Do you want to be made whole? Would, do you want to be healed? And you know what his response was? He started giving them every single reason, <laughs> every single reason why he couldn't be healed, why he couldn't change his circumstance, why he couldn't change his life. When he literally missed the revelation that the one who was asking him, do you want to be healed, was the one who can heal him. And too many of us, we are too busy giving reasons and not getting a revelation that God has given you his word and his word wants to deliver us. Amen? Amen. But too many of us are pushing back the word, rejecting the word, questioning the word. Let me tell you something. Do that. Tell me how that's working for you. How many years have you been laying on that mat? How many years? And we know the story. He told him, rise up and what? Booyah. 
hold on. And then, but not just that, not, not just that. Then, then he said, but he also said, pick up your mat. Pick up your mat. Rise up. And then go with it. Go, go with your mat. You know why? Because just like Lazarus, it says, and when the people saw what Jesus did, they believed him. So God wants to use and repurpose, repurpose your issue. He wants to repurpose what you call pain, suffering, setback. God says, I, I, I want to use this. I, I'm going to use this. And every single time that you walk and that people see you, they'll see that, man, God was faithful. He delivered me from this issue. He delivered. We all have issues, but we have a testimony that he can deliver us from any single issue. Amen? I ran out of time. Get up to your feet. Stand to your feet quickly.